Energy is a topic of each and every one of us. Do you go for profitability over sustainability? AI and machine learning is redefining each industry. Hi, and welcome to That Energy Show. My name is Amna, and I work in the communications team at Siemens Energy, where we tackle the world's energy demands. One of our challenges? communicating about these topics, breaking down why energy demand, security and transition are changing the world we live in forever. So over the course of this show, we're going to have some candid and bold discussions with some of our energy experts to try and explain and simplify why energy matters and how we can get ahead of the curve. Our guest for this season will be Karim Amin, our executive board member and head of our gas services business. So if you're interested, keep watching and make sure to subscribe to watch a new episode every month. Kareem, not a bad time to be leading gas, is it now? Not at all. I think it's the once of a lifetime opportunity to witness all this uh, growth, a chance to really influence the way we, we live our lives in the future. We hear a lot of words, a lot of buzzwords. Of course, we know enough to do our jobs, but we're not like the experts, right, in the room, like the engineers, like the people who work on our sites, on the turbines. So I want to start with my favorite buzzword, maybe from this year that we keep hearing around, especially with AI data centers taking over record demand. So I want you to help us break down what this big surge of electricity or energy really means. How big really is it and what's causing it? Thank you, Amna. And I think you really started uh, with a very important uh, principle and notion. Energy is not a topic for uh, technical people or engineers. Energy is a topic of each and every one of us. Uh, it is how we live our lives. It's how we contribute to the society and the economic development. So it's very important to use platforms like this one to share information, to start a dialogue, and to better understand uh, what does this really mean. And with this, I think we will have a much better progress towards uh, the destination that we want to reach. And let's start by the record demand. Uh, of course, it is right now all over the news. The need for electricity is unprecedented. We are expected to see the energy consumption double by 2050. This means that in the next 25 years, we need to build infrastructure, capacity, ability of people to work on projects and deliver them, exactly the same what we did in the last 150 years. Because AI and machine learning is redefining each industry. Think about medical sector, think about industries, think about uh, all, all the human activities that we have in our day-to-day -day lives. It will be completely redefined. And in you, you add to that the third pillar of electrification. Electrification in mobility, so using of all electrical vehicles, electrification in high energy intensity industries, electrification of heat uh, that is being used in uh, heating our houses, but also in certain industries that has heat as an important element of their production factors. This is a transformation of how we will use uh, electricity in our lives going forward in the future. The intensity is going to change from the world we know today. Well, Karim, you said something that really stuck with me. Twent in the next 25 years, we need to build up the same as we did for 150 years. It seems like we're playing catch up, like we're really behind on a schedule that maybe we didn't see coming. So how did we end up here? Do you think we missed all the signals? How would you interpret us being in a place where we're playing catch up? It is partly predictable. I mean, this is, physics does not change. We knew from the beginning that all this population that is growing, all the economic uh, development that we see around us, uh, let's not forget up till now, there's still more than 600 million people in Africa that are living without access to electricity. This era of digitalization and AI was around the corner. I think part of it was definitely predictable. What we lacked is the imagination mm -hmm. to imagine how this will change our lives. Uh, the other aspect, of course, is although we are looking at the future, the ways we are doing our business today, uh, when it comes to financing, when it comes to permitting, when it comes to policy creation and so on, is still stuck in the early 2000s or at best 2015, whereas we are looking 
with a, a lot of uh, uh, speed and uh, uh, hope in, in the 2050. And there is definitely a mismatch there. Um, I would say there is a lot to be uh, done uh, to catch up. We haven't lost the race, but a lot has to be done and a lot has to be done fast. So imagination is one of the most important things I want to leave uh, for us in the discussion today. And also looking at uh, how can we do things differently. Think about uh, you know, the way we are discussing today executing projects or the way we are discussing um, building these policies with the governments and so on. It takes such a long time and we are looking forward right now to have something like a breakthrough. Uh, in, in the way we are uh, executing our projects because climate change is a very important topic and we need to start thinking about a system and imagine a system rather than imagining a specific uh, sector. Uh, we have been experiencing in the past a lot of discussions about renewables. Thinking about renewables in terms of solar power, in terms of wind power, grid was not very much talked about back then. Right. So the system of how do you move from the transition of electricity of the past to the future in a system and all what we need to make the system deliver what it needs to deliver in a fast pace. Do you think this imagination is there now or is it only some experts like you and the industry picking up on this or do you think there's still time for the industry to have this imagination and, and really achieve this breakthrough? I think a lot has been uh, happening uh, in the past forced by uh, shocks. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have seen from COVID made us imagine better. Russia uh, invasion of Ukraine made us imagine better. How could we do all these vaccinations that normally used to take years and years in two to three weeks. Imagination. Right? Uh, the cut of gas supply from, from Russia to Europe in the middle of uh, cold winter and infrastructure has been built north of Germany, for example, for the LNG in record times. I mean, nobody would have uh, thought that you could get a permit for an LNG terminal in the north of Germany and get it built and get the cargoes of the LNG delivered in less than 10 months. So uh, I think this uh, made us believe that it is possible uh, if there is a will and if there is a, a target that needs to be reached. And there is no better time uh, for us right now to push further this imagination because we are equipped with a lot of tools uh, that would help us to uh, act much faster if we have the right imagination. And when we talk about this, Kareem, you're, you're talking from the heart of the industry, you work at Siemens Energy. Do you think the industry is capable of meeting this demand? Like honest, candid, we're here trying to be honest to everybody. Do you think we're on the cusp of another capacity crunch or crisis or they'll find a way or we'll find a way because we have to? You have to curves and here we need to talk a bit uh, like engineers we have two curves you have a linear curve and you have an exponential curve yeah, I know that much yeah right I can so uh, <laughs> the linear curve is how we are building capacity and how we're looking at how an industry could match a demand recruitment of people finding the skilled workforce looking at making investment decisions to build capacities etc., financing that goes behind it, and so on, it's a linear curve. You see on the surface uh, aggressive investments, doubling the renewable uh, capacity production, that's, that's a target that uh, everybody uh, is going um, uh, behind. A lot is being done in terms of capacity building, a lot is being done uh, in terms of pushing the innovation, but underneath the surface, the industry is still struggling with supply chain disruptions, is still struggling with finding the right uh, calibers uh, in, in the places where we need them. Uh, so there's still a lot of things that needs to be resolved uh, and it needs to be resolved with a lot of speed, a lot of imagination and also using the tools of you know, the modern technology that we have available in our hands today. Karim, when we speak about the 2030, 2035 timeline, are we still speaking about a lack of imagination or is it sometimes deliberate? 
A bit of both, I would say. Uh, 2030, 2035 is a convenient uh, yeah. time timeline because it's it's uh, soon enough that people feel we need to act, and it's also say a little bit into the future that you could defer responsibility uh, and um, you know kick the can uh, down the road. Someone else's problem. Someone else's problem. We need to think about 2050. Uh, we have projects and innovation cycles that takes five to 10 years. So whatever we need in 2040, 2050 is being designed today. And if the cycles of decision-making, of financing, uh, of policy creation and so on is around 2030, uh, then this would not help us to get there uh, with, the, with the will and with the determination and the resolute we need to create uh, this future. I think uh, we are looking here at a fundamental change that is needed uh, to, get, to get to this point. Um, and the world is much more aware about it. Climate change remains to be a very important challenge the world needs to resolve. Uh, we've just seen the floods in Texas. Um, Europe has seen one of the highest heat waves. So this is super important that we are shifting gears and thinking of how the world needs to be in 2050 and act now. Kelim, because you promised that you would come into this with an open mind, honest, and um, I'm going to take the liberty of maybe asking a little bit more, putting you a bit in the hot seat. So I want to combine a couple of topics. Maybe if we take it back to five years ago, a lot of the narrative around gas, that gas is a dying business, that this is not the future anymore, that we're not going to sell anymore. And, and maybe some went as far as saying that Siemens was spinning off Siemens Energy to shed off a dying business and really soar with the rest. And of course, before that, we, we had seen headlines. Um, gas, is, uh, gas is never coming back. Gas is out of the picture. The big discussion, and we're also active right, in, in renewables. Hydrogen, we're fixated on hydrogen for years and years. Maybe the past two years, the tide started to shift. So maybe it's a double compounded question. How would you respond to this narrative or to this myth that gas ever was a dying business? Or why did it appear that way? And then maybe how you also felt as a leader in a business that's being labeled as a dying business. Did you have doubts? Did you ever think, OK, it's time, it's a sinking ship? Thank you so much for the question. I, I really uh, like uh, to go into this topic because it's a very, very important topic, not only in the context of Siemens Energy and in the context of gas, but for everybody to, to really think about uh, there is no single source of truth and reality. And things are very dynamic and change, and we need to be uh, prepared to, to live through these changes, adapt, and, and reinvent uh, our future. And that's a perfect example uh, when you look at this gas. And if you could go a bit further and say, we could have shut this business down, or we could have um, uh, sold it, or did something with it, imagine, again, back to our imagination, how we would have had uh, the situation for us today, not only as a business, but as a company that has a purpose which is to energize society. And here I want to say we identify ourselves as an energy company. And if the energy is going to come from rotating equipment that is fired with gas, then we will do that. If the energy is going to come from rotating equipment that is fired with green gas or uh, attached to it carbon capture solution, then we're going to do that. If the future is going to be that the energy will come from fusion, we will do this. So uh, we identify ourselves with the energy and not with the product. Mm -hmm. Electricity is in each and every aspect of our life. It's not anymore a commodity. It's really a matter of national security. So we knew that uh, dispatchable power is uh, irreplaceable. Uh, but we knew also that we need a path towards decarbonization. Um, uh, but we also had uh, very clear indications that we need to shut down coal and there was a lot of replacement of coal to gas. Gas, if it replaces coal, um, reduces CO2 emissions by up to 60%. If you add to this gas capacity some sort of a decarbonization technology, for example, a blend with uh, green hydrogen, then the 60% could go up to 80%. And then you, you don't need to run it all the time. You need to run it only when needed. Uh, which is uh, the time when the renewable electricity 
is low on the grid. Kareem, it's been really great uh, to talk to you about all of this. I want to wrap up with a very quick uh, for or against segment. I'm going to throw at you some maybe a little bit um, controversial uh, in some areas statements, and I want you to give me a quick answer for or against. So I'm going to start with hydrogen can close the demand gap. For or against the statement? For with a few statements uh, that I have to say. Hydrogen is a very important tool in our hand, but we have to walk away from these very ambitious and unrealistic cost targets. So we need to understand that it has a cost, and this cost uh, needs to be factored into our decision making. Coal is making a comeback. I think we need to get out of coal. Siemens Energy decided to get out of coal. Uh, there is timelines that each country takes. Some of them are uh, more longer than others, but we should get out of coal. We should slow down electrification to protect the grid. 100% against. We should accelerate all the investments and innovation and all the policy and decision making around permitting for the grid so that we can unlock and unleash the potential of the electrification that lies ahead of us. Thank you so much, Kareem. I hope you enjoyed this. And to everybody who watched us, please make sure to like, subscribe. We're new to this, but I guess this is what they say on the YouTube channel. <laughs> Send us your comments, questions. What would you like to hear from us, from Kareem? Thank you so much.